Hey friends. So uh, here is lesson two of our new unit. So this is the fifth unit that we have been dealing with. Um, I'm calling it the fourth unit of differentiation. You'll recall that the first unit was limits. Um, and now we're going differentiation one, differentiation two, differentiation three and four. Uh, so our second lesson yesterday, uh, or last lesson, we talked about the mean value theorem. Um, the next two lessons kind of go hand in hand. So I would encourage you to kind of watch them uh, back to back. Um, they're not complicated. Um, they're just kind of solidifying things that I, I really do think as we go through it, you're going to be like, yeah, yeah, that's that's super logical. So um, I'm not super concerned. Hopefully you're not super concerned, but uh, let's let's journey together. OK, so extrema. Uh, the extreme values of F are the absolute maximum and absolute minimum values of F. Now, just to talk about that for a second, let me just put on some ink here. Um, if I gave you a graph that looked like this, okay, what I would want you to say right away is, hey, if, if we think about the range for a second, um, this graph is never going to get any higher than that point. So that guy there, we would call an absolute maximum, okay? Whereas this guy here, so let me just, that's an absolute maximum. This guy is not considered a uh, absolute maximum, but it is a maximum for that little moment in time, okay? So we will often call those guys local maxes or local mins. OK, uh, you'll hear a few different words for it, but essentially what it means is it acts like a maximum point. It's it's a change of direction um, and it acts like a maximum point for that moment. So if I looked to the left and to the right of that point, the Y values would be lower. OK, same thing with absolute, but an absolute is absolute because nothing in that graph will ever be higher than that point. OK, so. Absolute or global maximum and minimum value. So again, that word global is also interchangeable with absolute, okay? The function f has an absolute maximum at c if f of c is larger than f of x uh, for all x in the domain of f, okay? So if that y value, if that output is the largest uh, output of the entire function, then it's an absolute max. The number f of c is called the absolute maximum value of f. Okay, very similar. A function f has an absolute minimum at c if, well, now you think through that, uh, you're going to say f of c is less than or equal to f of x for all x in the domain of f. Okay, and then again, the number f of c would be called the absolute minimum value of f. Okay, so those are the formal definitions of absolute max and mins. Now, a function f has a local or relative maximum. Okay, we can say either one there, local or relative, at c if f of c is greater than f of x when x is close to c and on both sides of C, okay? Something that starts and moves to the right going up, you can't call that a, a relative max, sorry, uh, something that starts and moves down. I just listened to the picture that I did. Let me just draw something for you. Just for clarification, um, I gotta turn my ink back on here, sorry. So if I gave you something like, uh, why didn't you start? Okay, if I gave you something like this, Okay, you can't call that a local max because there's nothing on the other side. If it went like that, then you could call it a local max. Okay, uh, but it has to be on both sides of um, the x value of c. Okay, okay, and then a function f has a local or relative minimum at c if f of c is less than or equal to f of x when x is close to c, and again has to be on both sides of c. The number f of c is called the local or relative minimum value of f, okay? All right, so critical points. Critical points 
are points on a function where the derivative is equal to zero or the derivative is undefined, doesn't exist, okay? So let's take a look at the extreme value theorem. <clears throat> Pardon me. If f is continuous on the closed interval of a to b, then there exists a number c in that interval such that f of c is greater than f of x or equal to f of x for all values of x within the interval. The number f of c is called the absolute maximum value of f on the closed interval a to b, okay? So if we have a closed interval, by default, we will have an absolute maximum, is what that's saying, okay? And by default, we'll have an absolute, min an absolute minimum, which is what the next paragraph says. If f of x, sorry, if f is continuous on the closed interval of a to b, then there exists a number c in that closed interval such that f of c is less than f of x or equal to f of x, for all values of x within the interval, and that's called the absolute minimum value. So a bunch of words to say, if we have a closed interval, there must be a top and there must be a bottom to that closed interval, okay? That is what the extreme value theorem is stating. Now, a note about theorems. We have now looked at three of them, the intermediate value theorem, the mean value theorem, and now the extreme value theorem. Um, collectively, these theorems are called existence theorems, as they guarantee the existence of a function input that has a certain property. So thinking through uh, AP justifications, they are important in justifications of various calculus concepts. If an AP question is asking you about the existence of a function, you're probably looking at trying to use one of these theorems in your justification, okay? Okay. For each function below, determine the absolute and local maximum and minimum values and the values of where they occur, okay? So we'll walk through each of these. I'm just gonna, I think my head is gonna be in the way of that particular paragraph. So I'll just hide myself for a quick sec, just so that you at home, if you don't have the book, can see the question. Okay, so below is the graph of y equals f of x. Now, we're just gonna fill in the blanks together. The function f has an absolute maximum. Well, I know I have an absolute maximum right here. Nothing is going to go higher than that, okay? So I have an absolute maximum at 10, at x equals 10, sorry. The absolute maximum value will be eight, okay? If I just trace that along, okay? The function f has an absolute minimum at x equals, well, my absolute minimum would be right here. Now, before you start yelling at me, a couple seconds ago, I said, and just because sometimes you only half listen to me, a couple of seconds ago, I said, oh, it has to be on both sides. That was for the relative or local max or mins, okay? An absolute max or min does not have to be present on both sides, but the local max or mins do have to be present on both sides. Okay, so the function f has an absolute minimum at x equals two and the absolute minimum value is zero. Okay. Okay, pretty straightforward, I think. The function f has a local maximum at, well, local max would be any time I change direction, whether it was absolute to begin with or not. So there's actually two of them here. I've got one right here and I've got one right here again. So I've got x equals four and x equals 10. And then the local maximum values of f respectively, respectively means I'm going to say them in the same order that I said the x equals values. So that would be five and eight. Okay, then the function has a local minimum at x equals seven. Again, this is where I cannot say I have a local min at two because I don't exist on both sides of that. Okay, uh, the local minimum value of f is three, okay? All right, let's try another one. Uh, this would be a great time for you to pause me and fill in the blanks yourself. Welcome back. Uh, okay, the function f does not have an absolute maximum. This is gonna go up forever, okay, in both directions, and so there is no absolute max. The function f has an absolute minimum at x equals negative three right here, and the absolute minimum value of f is negative 15, okay? 
function f has a local maximum uh, at x equals 1, and the local maximum is 10. Okay. Then the function has a local minimum. There's actually two, one right here and one right here. So at negative 3 and at positive 3. And then respectively, the local minimum values would be negative 15 and 5. Okay. All right, my friends, try this one. Pause me again. Thanks for joining me again. Uh, okay, the function g has an absolute max at x equals negative 1. Uh, the absolute maximum value of g is 6. Then the function g has an absolute minimum at x equals negative 4. Again, because it's absolute, I don't need to be on both sides, but I'm not going to call that a relative minimum in a second. The absolute minimum of g is negative uh, 4, okay? And the function g has a local maximum. Uh, there are two of them at x equals negative 1 and x equals 4. The local maximum values of g, respectively, would be 6 and 3. And then the function g has a local minimum at x equals 1, and the local minimum value of f is 2, okay? All right, consider each function on the closed interval of zero to six, okay? Is the function continuous on the closed interval zero to six? Well, the answer is no, I have an asymptote right there, okay? Does the function have an absolute maximum on uh, zero to six? The answer would be no. And does the function have an absolute minimum on 0 to 6, the answer would be no, because in this closed interval, I'm actually shooting up to positive infinity at some point, and I'm shooting down to negative infinity at some point. Okay? All right, consider this one. So on the closed interval 0 to 6, you need to note that 0 doesn't exist and 6 also doesn't exist. Okay? Uh, is the function continuous? The answer is no, because I have a hole at 0 and I have a hole at 6. Does the function have uh, an absolute maximum on zero to six? Again, the answer is no, because I don't actually know, I don't have a top to this because I'm approaching a point of discontinuity. Uh, does the function have an absolute minimum? Again, my answer would be no, okay? Okay, and then the third one that you're looking at there, is the function continuous? No, again, I have an asymptote at two. Does the function have an absolute maximum? No. Does it have a minimum, an absolute minimum? Yes. Okay. I will never go below whatever this point here at six was. Okay. Now, some of your, some of your instinctively thinking, because I can hear your thoughts. Uh, yeah, but that's going to carry on forever and ever. ever and it's going to get closer and closer to zero. You're absolutely right. But remember, I'm on a closed interval right now. I'm only looking from zero to six. I'm not looking past six. So at six right now, there is definitely an absolute minimum, okay? Okay, is the function continuous from zero to six? Uh, I have a removable discontinuity at four, so no. Does the function have an absolute maximum? Uh, yes, it does, because at 4, I am at the highest point for this closed interval. Does the function have an absolute minimum? I can't say there's an absolute minimum because I'm approaching this removable discontinuity, um, so I would have to say no to that. Okay. Okay. Uh, graph a function. Let me just hide my big old head for a second. Uh, I didn't hide it. Uh -huh. Okay, uh, graph a function defined on the closed interval 0 to 6 that has the properties indicated. I want an absolute max at x equals 6, an absolute min at x equals 0, continuous everywhere but x equals 6. Go ahead and try something. Uh, if you're in a class right now, there could be, you know, 30 different answers. So don't be looking over at your neighbor and thinking, oh my god, I didn't do something right. Yours might be totally right as long as it fits the description. Okay, here's mine. So I'm going to go from 0 to 6, and I did something like this. 
So I have an absolute max at six, x equals six. I actually drew a point in, so that does uh, give me my absolute max. I have an absolute min at zero, uh, and I'm continuous everywhere but at six, okay? Cool, let's try the next one. Absolute max at two, absolute min at x equals four, and continuous everywhere but x equals zero, okay? So, Pause me, try it, take a leap of faith. Okay, and now here's my example. So I've marked the two, four, and six here. And I have something like this. Okay, so I'm continuous everywhere, but x equals zero. Uh, I've got a total absolute max at two. I've got a complete bottom here at four. And I've filled, or I've... Uh, satisfied all the parameters there, okay? Okay, which of these functions has an absolute maximum on the closed interval negative three to three? Choose all that apply. So I'm just looking for yes or no, but pause me, try each one. I'd love it if you could be able to do this without your graphing calculator, just with your head. What does cos x look like from negative three to three? Remember, negative three is really close to pi. Pi is 3.14. So like you could think of that right now from like negative pi to pi. Think about 10, think about negative one over x squared and think about sine of one over x. Okay, you got some, some conclusions for me. Uh, for f of x equals cos of x, the answer would be yes. You're gonna go like this. Okay, so you will definitely have a maximum there. Tan of x, the answer there is going to be no, because you're shooting up to infinity and down to negative infinity. There's no max there. Um, h of x equals negative 1 over x squared. That is going to be a yes. Uh, there is an absolute max there. And then sine of 1 over x, also uh, a yes. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so if we do not know what the graph of a function looks like, how can we find the local maximum and minimum values? Examine the graph of f below. Now, if you have tuned me out up to this point, uh, this would be a good time to tune me back in. Uh, okay, so take a look at the graph you have in your book. I will just hide my head for those of you who are viewing at home without a book. Okay, for what value or values of x does f have a local maximum? Well, we see a local max at A, at C, and at E. Okay, A, C, and E. What's true about the derivative at these values? Well, at A and C, we would say the derivative is zero because I end up with a horizontal tangent line there. Then at E, that's a kink in the graph, so we would say there is no derivative. So the derivative is zero or non-existent at those three values. Uh, for what value or values of x does f have a local minimum? Well, that would be at b and at d, and I want you to notice the same thing. Um, either the derivative is zero, like in the case of b, or the derivative doesn't exist in the case of d, where I have a kink in the graph, okay? Okay, that leads us to a very important theorem called Fermat's theorem. Fermat's theorem says the following. If a function f has a local max or local min at c, then either the derivative of f at c is zero or the derivative of f at c doesn't exist, okay? So Fermat's theorem states essentially that if a function f has a local max or local min, it has to occur at a critical number. Okay, now note that the converse of Fermat's theorem is not necessarily true. Not all um, critical numbers are local max or mins. So to give you an example of that, we're going to take a look at f of x equals x cubed for a sec. You know enough about life and graphs to say that f of x equals x cubed looks like that. Okay. Now, if I was to then take a look at the derivative, that would be 3x squared, which would look something like this. Okay. So I see a critical number at x equals zero for the derivative, okay? At x equals zero, the derivative equals zero. But remembering that my red graph there is the original graph, it does not compute to a critical number, okay? 
uh, sorry, it does not compute to a max or a min of the graph. It is a critical number, but it does not compute to a max or a min. So what Fermat's theorem is saying is if I have a local max or min, it has to be at a critical number. But not all critical numbers are going to create local max or mins. Okay. Okay. So I'm just going to clear my ink there and we'll keep going here. You can use a graphing calculator to verify this. Well, we just did without a graphing calculator. Look at us and how smart we are. Okay, so find, determine the critical numbers of each function. Well, in order to determine the critical numbers of this guy, we're going to take the derivative. Uh, this is a polynomial, pretty easy to take the derivative now. Uh, 3x squared, I got 12x and 9, right? 3x squared plus 12x plus 9. Now, the critical numbers are where the derivative equals 0 or doesn't exist. I would want you to be comfortable to say there is no place where this derivative uh, doesn't exist because it's a polynomial function and polynomial functions have um, the domain exists everywhere. But I will set it equal to zero. I'll divide by three and I'll go ahead and factor. So I've got x plus one and x plus three. And so the critical numbers there would be x equals negative one and x equals three. Okay, x equals negative one and x equals three. Now, uh, f of x equals the absolute value of x. Um, we have dealt with absolute value before. We know that when we take the derivative, we have to split it uh, into piecewise function um, because of the fact that I have to look to the left and to the right uh, of my um, my vertex of the absolute value. Uh, so to the left, the derivative would actually be negative one and to the right, the derivative would be one. And then actually at x equals zero, uh, the derivative doesn't exist. Okay, so we say I'm one uh, to the right and I'm negative one to the left, but then the critical number would be x equals zero because it's at this point where the derivative doesn't exist. Okay. All right, and then we're going to take a look at the root of x. Well, to take the derivative of that, that's x to the one half, so that we're looking at one half x to the negative one half, which is one over two root x. Okay. Now, um, I know I have an NPV at x equals zero because I can't have zero on the bottom here. So I know that's a critical number. Then my question would be, is there any spot where this graph can equal zero? The answer to that is no. Um, I'm hoping you are comfortable with that statement, but if you're not, throw it in your graphing calculator and take a look at it. Um, but for sure, I have a critical number at x equals zero because the derivative uh, does not exist at that point. Okay, awesome. Okay, so determine the local maximum and minimum values of f of x equals x cubed plus 6x squared plus 9x plus 2. Now, this is the same polynomial I started you off with a couple of examples ago. So we've already figured out the derivative. We've already set it equal to zero. We've already found our critical number. So I'm just throwing those back up into the slide. And I'll hide my head just for a second for those of you who are at home and don't have access to the book. Okay, so now I'm going to take you back to 20-1. We did a whole series of questions in 20-1 where we talked about uh, is this quadratic greater than zero or less than zero? And what we did was we found, uh, we factored it, we found the roots, and then we plotted those roots on a number line. We're going to do the same thing here. We're going to take my negative one and negative three. I plotted it on a number line. And now I'm going to throw in some values that represent each section. So I know that this represents less than negative three. This represents in between negative three and negative one. And this represents greater than negative one. Okay, so I'm plugging those back into the derivative to see whether I get a positive answer or a negative answer. Go ahead and do that. And then what you would get is positive, negative, and positive. So now this is telling me, remember if the derivative is positive, the original function had to have been increasing. And if the derivative is negative, the original function had to have been decreasing. So at negative three, what I want you to notice is this is telling me the derivative is changing from positive to negative, which means the original function is changing from increasing to decreasing, which means at negative three, I must be a local uh, maximum. Then at negative one, I'm the original function the derivative is changing from negative to positive, so the original function is changing from decreasing to increasing, which means I found a local minimum. Now, how do I get the y values that actually go with the negative 3 and negative 1? I just plug them back into my original function. 
Okay, so I have a local maximum at f of negative three equals two. Again, I got that two by just plugging negative three back to my original f of x. The function changes from increasing to decreasing. And then I have a local minimum at f equals negative one. Sorry, f of negative one equals negative two. And then that's because the function is changing from decreasing to increasing. You're already yelling at me, do I need all the words? My answer is yes. Yes, you do. Okay. You have to justify how you know you have a local max or a local min. Uh, now, just to throw a uh, visual at you, this is the graph of the original function. And you can see I have a local max at negative three and a local min at negative one. Okay. Okay. Now, determine the absolute max and min values. Um, so same function, I've already tested, I already know where the local max or mins are, but now I've given you a closed interval. Remember, as soon as I give you a closed interval, there has to be an absolute max or min. Now, your absolute max or mins must either be at a critical number or at an endpoint. You have already figured out where the critical numbers are and what their uh, Y values are that go with them. You just have to figure out what f of negative five is and what f of zero is and compare all those numbers, okay? So check the critical numbers and the endpoints. We know now that f of negative five is negative 18, f of negative three is two, f of negative one is negative two, and f of zero is two. Again, for those of you who are home without a book, just hiding my head so you can see the full question there, okay? All right, well, uh, Looking at all these y values, I have an absolute minimum at f of negative 5 equals negative 18, and I have an absolute maximum actually in two different places at f of negative 3 equals 2 and at f of 0 equals 2. Okay, so I have an absolute minimum at f of negative 5 equals negative 18, and an absolute maximum at f of negative 3 equals 2 and f of 0 equals 2. Cool. So procedure for finding the absolute maximum and minimum values of a continuous function on a closed interval A to B. I'll just hide my big old head for a quick sec. Find the values of F at the critical numbers of F in the uh, open interval A to B. Then find F at the endpoints, that is evaluate F of A and F of B. And then the largest values from step one and two is the absolute max, and the smallest values is the absolute min, okay? Okay, let me hide. Determine the local and absolute maximum and minimum values of f of x equals x to the two over three uh, times five plus x on the interval negative five to one. So for sure, I'm gonna have to plug in uh, f of negative five and f of one, but I also have to figure out the critical numbers. That's where I'm gonna start. In order to figure out the critical numbers, I need to take the derivative and figure out where the derivative equals zero or where the derivative doesn't exist, okay? Uh, given all your extensive derivative knowledge, you should be looking at this question and saying, hey, I need to use the product rule. So the derivative of f times g plus f times derivative of g is what you see here. Okay, I'm now going to factor out um, the x to the negative one third. So if I factor out the x to the negative one third, that leaves me with, let me just, um, let me get ink on here again for you for one sec. So if I factored the x to the negative one third out of both of these, on the first term, this is the first term here, right? So it's going to leave me with two thirds five plus x because the x to negative one third got factored out. Here, I end up essentially going x to the two thirds divided by x to the negative one third, which is going to give me x to the three over three, which is just x. And that's where that x there is coming from. Okay. Okay, so then I just want to clean up inside here. Um, this is going to essentially give me uh, 10 plus 3x over 3, and then I can call this guy 3x over 3 as well. So that'll give me, oh, sorry, 2x. I said 3x for this guy. Um, x times 2, last I checked, was 2x. So that gives me 10 plus 2x plus 3x. Um, again, 
I don't want anybody sitting stressed. Two times five is the 10. Two times X gives me the two X. That's what gave me this whole 10 plus two X over three. This guy, I called this three X over three. So I had a common denominator, okay? Okay, so that's where I'm left at the moment. Um, and then I can just, I can add the two X and three X together. Um, and then I factored out the five. So that gives me five times X plus two over three. And then I just changed this to one over the cube root of X. Okay. So if I look at this, <clears throat> um, the top part is going to tell me where X equals zero, right? So I know that, uh, the derivative equals zero at negative two. And the bottom part is going to tell me where I don't exist. The derivative can't exist at x equals 0. So I have two critical numbers, x equals negative 2 and x equals 0. Okay. And so now I am going to plug those into or plot those on a number line. I need to find a number less than negative 2, plug it into the derivative to see if the derivative is positive or negative. Find a number in between negative 2 and 0, plug it into the derivative. Find a number greater than 0, plug it into the derivative. End up with positive, negative, positive. So at negative 2, I'm the derivative is switching from positive to negative, which means the original function is switching from increasing to decreasing. So that's a local max. Uh, at zero, I'm switching from decreasing to increasing because the derivative is switching from negative to positive. So that would be a local uh, minimum. I also want to, so I'm going to plug negative two into the original equation and get the y value and zero into the original equation and get the y value. That will give me my local items. Then I also want to plug negative five back into the original equation and one back into the original equation so that I can compare all four and decide where my absolute maximums are, okay? So f of negative five is zero, f of negative two is 4.762, f of zero, zero, f of one is six. So looking at all of that, I'm now ready to state my answers. Again, there are four things I need to state here. I need to state the local min, the local max, the absolute min, and the absolute max, okay? so. I have a local maximum at f of negative two equals 4.762. I have a local min at f of zero is zero. I have an absolute max at f of one equals six. And then I have an absolute min in two places, f of zero is zero and f of negative five is zero, okay? All right, that concludes uh, this note. Um, now, if you, have a book, you will notice that I go right into the next section, um, 5.3. Um, and then what will happen is you will have practice on 5.2 and 5.3 together. Okay. So if you got the time, uh, maybe watch the 5.3 video first, uh, and then you can try all the homework. Okay. So eventually between 5.2 and 5.3, when we want to get up to, uh, page 298 there. Okay. All right, so uh, I'll leave you at that for now. Um, you can start trying your homework or you can go right to the next video. Either way, if you have any questions, make sure you're connecting with me, okay? You guys get this, take care.